Hello and welcome to the latest episode of IMTV. Uh, I'm your host for tonight, Adam Booth, the editor of Socialist.net, the website Socialist Appeal, the uh, British section of the International Marxist Tendency, and it's the International Marxist Tendency uh, bringing you tonight uh, this birthday celebration uh, that we're having. Uh, it's happy birthday to Vladimir Lenin. Uh, the 150th birthday of uh, Lenin today. And uh, to celebrate, we're going to be having uh, Rob Sewell in a minute, the editor of Socialist Appeal, uh, joining us to give us a special lecture. Uh, it's not going to be a Q&A this time round. It's just going to be a special lecture uh, talk by Rob about the life and ideas of Lenin, the revolutionary ideas uh, and the revolutionary role of Lenin. Uh, so, without further ado, let me bring in Rob. Hello, Rob. You okay there? Hello, there, all right. Yes, yeah. very good. Nice to see you again. Uh, so, it is, as I said to the viewers, a birthday celebration today. Uh, so, would you like to, uh, well, basically go ahead and tell us all about the life and ideas of Vladimir Lenin? Yes, yeah, so well, obviously, um, this year has a number of anniversaries. But this is a particularly uh, special one um, because Lenin himself uh, and his ideas, well, he changed the course of, of world history. And I would say that, uh, you know, this celebration is, is not a, like any old one. But, um, it's in the midst of the deepest crisis of capitalism in the history of capitalism. And I think what we have to underline and understand is that we're entering a, a very, very stormy period, a very revolutionary period uh, in which all countries are going to be affected by a revolutionary wave after revolutionary wave. It's going to be big changes in consciousness. In other words, what we're talking about is a, an epoch of, of world revolution uh, uh, in the very, very near future. We're in it now, in fact. And uh, therefore, the ideas of, of, of Lenin who after all is uh, known for um, not just uh, leading the Russian Revolution, but his ideas on world revolution are more relevant today than they were when they were originally uh, written. Um, of course, uh, Lenin has had uh, very bad press, you might say, over the last uh, uh, hundred years, insofar as that uh, he's been uh, attacked and there's a whole industry, really, of historians, bourgeois historians, who have produced a volume after volume, year after year, to denounce the Russian Revolution, and above all, to denounce uh, Lenin and his role in the revolution, and to slander his ideas, slander him as an individual, saying that he was in favour of terrorism, he was a, a murderer, he was a psychopath, you name it, they have accused him of everything. And the reason for this, obviously, is that uh, they have an agenda, and their agenda is to try and uh, cover the uh, Russian Revolution, and cover Lenin as much dirt as possible, so that uh, they're not attracted, attractive to a new generation of, uh, of young workers and of uh, young people in general. And this is particularly the case, I would say, now, when uh, there is alarm out there. You know, uh, Henry Kissinger is talking about the world on fire. And there are many bourgeois uh, strategists who are talking about uh, revolutionary implications, uh, changes in consciousness, all sorts of questions, which is entirely true. And therefore, the ideas of, of revolution, the ideas of Marxism, of Leninism, if you want to put it that way, are certainly um, attractive and will be more attractive to many, many people in the coming uh, period. And therefore, there's going to be an increase, uh, an attempt to uh, uh, slander this uh, individual and is worth us defending and bringing out the real ideas of Lenin. Uh, although I did notice uh, the other day that the Financial Times, uh, although it's not a paper read by workers, of course, uh, did quote, uh, um, well, it's, it's quoted uh, the strategist of the Bank of America, who in turn have quoted, it says, quoting Russian Revolution leader Vladimir Lenin, the Bank of America's analysts said, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. Well, that's, that's very true at the present time, that's quite clear. Although I think the, the quote is, uh, uh, I think, from Marx rather than Lenin, but that's another matter that you can take up. It shows that they are, even the serious bourgeois, have to take some of these ideas on board. 
But as far as we're concerned, it's, it's far deeper than that, far richer than that. Um, his ideas are uh, an advance, if you like, on the ideas of, of Marx and Engels. They were a development of those ideas. And uh, it is quite remarkable that uh, Lenin, who turned out to be one of the greatest uh, working class leaders uh, in the world, nevertheless didn't come from the working class. He came from a, an upper middle class uh, background, a kind of bourgeois background. And yet uh, he was prepared to break from his uh, class background and, and adopt the viewpoint of the working class. And that was done at a very uh, early age in his life, when he was a young uh, student. Um, at that time in, in Russia, we should uh, recall that um, uh, the regime in Russia was an extremely despotic, czarist uh, regime. There was no democratic rights where everything was suppressed. There was no, no legal trade unions or political parties at that point of view. And um, this regime was detested. And the young people of that time turned towards an organization called the People's Will and attempted to overthrow czarism by terrorist method, methods. And uh, they did actually succeed in overthrowing um, or, or killing the, 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 the czar, it was uh, Alexander II. Although then he was followed by Alexander III, who uh, uh, introduced a, a regime of, of terror, if you like. And it showed that uh, you know, individual terrorism couldn't solve this particular problem because you get rid of the czar, another one comes along. You get rid of the general, another one's put in his place. And nevertheless, these, there was a lot of uh, many young uh, students, young people in Russia who were heroic people, really, who, de who dedicated themselves to the overthrow of this repressive regime. In fact, Lenin's brother, uh, Alexander was uh, hanged because of the role he played in an, an attempted uh, assassination attempt in relation to uh, Alexander III. Um, and uh, obviously that deeply influenced uh, uh, Lenin, politicized uh, Lenin, although he then didn't join the, uh, the uh, workers, uh, the people's will, these Narodniks, these uh, young people who would engage in individual terrorism. He began to draw wider conclusions and was attracted by these new ideas, that is of Marxism in Russia itself. And uh, as a young student, he was engaged in activities, revolutionary activities. He was expelled uh, from university. Uh, he managed to, to finish the degree on, on the, he came to become a lawyer and went and moved uh, from Kazan to uh, Petersburg, St. Petersburg. And, all, and then began to establish a workers' circle to discuss these ideas. Uh, and then abroad, um, these are the, are the, the Marxist organization in Russia, of course, it wasn't in Russia, it was abroad because of the illegal conditions. It's a small grouping around a man called Plekhanov, who became known as the father of Russian Marxism. And there were perhaps half a dozen collaborators in uh, Switzerland. And uh, Lenin uh, got in touch with these individuals and they set up, they had an organization called the Emancipation of, of Labor. And they argued for the ideas of Marxism. They, they combated the ideas of individual terrorism. It's quite ironic that these bourgeois historians attack Lenin as a terrorist, you know, in favor of terrorism and so on. In fact, he was against the ideas of individual terrorism because they wouldn't work. They'd be counterproductive and that the, he relied on, on the, the power of the working class uh, in order to change society itself. And it wouldn't be done by a minority, but the majority of workers in, in Russia and poor peasants that would overthrow not just czarism, but overthrow the system uh, itself. So it's ironic that uh, they accuse him of something which he's not uh, obviously uh, uh, guilty of. And he was attracted to these ideas of Marxism, which he studied. He was then arrested when he came back uh, from um, Switzerland after visiting Plekhanov, and uh, was uh, imprisoned and then uh, sent to exile in, in Siberia. And he used this time, as many of the revolutionaries did, to study. And uh, he conquered his, his, these ideas. I mean, Lenin wasn't born Lenin. Lenin developed himself, and it was a conscious attempt to raise his, his understanding, particularly of Marxism, that he read and read and read and studied these ideas, not for an academic, uh, in any academic sense, but to preparing for the um, uh, problems of the revolution in Russia and internationally. And of course, when he came back from exile in 1900, he, he participated with the Plekhanov industrial group 
to uh, uh, establish or re-establish. There was a first attempt in uh, 1898 to establish a, a socialist party in Russia, Russian, Russian Social Democrat Labour Party, but they were all arrested. And um, there were different ideas floating around and uh, um, Lenin and Plekhanov and the group uh, uh, criticized these ideas, Once one called economism which was an attempt to say that the workers should just uh, concentrate on economic questions, bread and butter issues. Um, there was another legal Marxism, which is in that contradiction in terms, which tried to uh, uh, take out the revolutionary content of Marxism, basically. And uh, uh, Lenin and uh, Plekhanov and the group launched a, a newspaper called Iskra as, an, uh, as a, a weapon to argue for the genuine ideas of Marxism and to criticize these other tendencies in the in the, in the workers' movement, and they were very effective in, in doing this. Uh, Lenin worked here in London in 1902, 1903, in editing uh, Iskra, and um, they prepared the ground for the establishment of, of the relaunch, uh, really the founding of the Russian Socialist Party, which was um, in, uh, in 1903, which took place in Belgium and then in London. And um, this is where the, the famous split took place between uh, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. And uh, it, took late, it, it was late on in the conference that this split, split took place. And it was not over, over any political issues. It was all about the question of um, uh, what should be a member uh, and uh, who should be on the, on the editorial board. It's very, very secondary questions. But it was the attempt really by the Lenin who, who pushed the question to get to uh, to break with a small, if you like, the, the small circle mentality which which dominated uh, Russian uh, um, socialism at that time, and to establish a more firmer, professionally organised uh, party. And um, of course, at this point, uh, he wrote a, a very famous uh, work called "What Is to Be Done," in which he argues for the, the need for professional revolutionaries. Um, and he's been criticised ever since, I think, on that book. Which is all it is is a, de is a defense of the need for a professional party, organized properly, and, and so on. Also, he, he raises in this in this book a clear uh, message that of the importance of theory. He says, without revolutionary theory, there will be no revolutionary movement. Uh, theory is the bedrock of the party, and therefore the idea of training people, of cadre building, and so on, was the was the was the the key element of this work. He does make a mistake in it because um, in, in the book, uh, which was to say that uh, the working class would only reach a trade union consciousness left its own devices. Obviously, this was a mistake, and he was bending the stick um, too much against the uh, economist trend. In fact, it's an idea from Kautsky, because the workers can uh, and have, on many occasions, gone much further than trade unionism. Take the Chartists for, for, for an example, but there's many many workers who've drawn revolutionary conclusions to overthrow capitalism. She made a mistake, but that's the only mistake, which she never repeated again. But this was the basis, anyway, of trying to uh, get a professional party created. Uh, but this split between Mensheviks and, and Bolsheviks over organizational question was an anticipation of political differences that were going to emerge. Um, and this probably uh, uh, began to emerge in perspectives for the, for the, for the, for the Russian Revolution itself. Obviously, uh, Russia was very backward, uh, although new industries were being established and capitalism you know, uh, was being established from industries being set up by the British, the French, the Germans and so on, very advanced industries. And therefore, it was creating a young working class, which was a very uh, you know, a new development. And, but the revolution's task were like a bourgeois democratic task, that is, trying to get away the old order of feudalism, get the old czarism away and bring in the conditions that could create co uh, capitalism in Russia. Um, and this is called the bourgeois democratic revolution. And the Bolsheviks and uh, Lenin had the idea that, um, well, first of all, the Menshevik idea was that it should, it's a classical thing, it's a bourgeois revolution, therefore it should be led by the bourgeoisie and the workers should play a, a subordinate role. Lenin, on the other hand, uh, argued against that, saying, hang on, no, no, no. It's a bourgeois democratic revolution, but the bourgeoisie are incapable of playing the revolutionary role. They are counter-revolutionaries, as a matter of fact. They're linked up to imperialism and the landlords, they, they can't play that role. The only role, uh, revolutionary role, can be played is by the working class and, and, the, and the poor peasants linking up. 
and therefore it put forward the idea of a democratic dictatorship of proletariat and peasantry. And uh, on the other hand, he also said that the, a victory of, of, the, of this revolution, of the bourgeois revolution in Russia, would, would have a big effect in Europe, would give a, give a spur to the socialist revolution in the, in the West, which in turn would rebound in Russia and open up a socialist perspective as well. So it had, it had a very international connotation to this uh, perspective. Uh, the third uh, viewpoint was actually by, by Leon Trotsky, who talked about, uh, well, yes, it's a bourgeois democratic revolution. Yes, I agree with Lenin that the workers will lead this revolution. But he then said, look, I don't think it would, they would stay simply on bourgeois democratic uh, demands. They would move then, once they got to power, to, to introduce socialist measures. And he raised the first time of anybody in the backward country, the working class come to, come to power on the basis then of a socialist revolution. But of course, he said it's a permanent revolution because the conditions, the material basis for socialism didn't exist in Russia. That's quite obvious. That it's going to be taken only done on a world basis. And therefore, the, the permanence of the revolution, which would, which would spread, it'd be the beginning of a world revolution, socialist revolution, which would be the material basis for socialism itself. Those are the three perspectives, if you like, of, of the revolution. And in 1905, you had the Russian Revolution, born out of war, born out of defeat of the J Japanese uh, Russia war. Uh, you had the, the, the protests that began with the, you know, on a very low consciousness of, of workers uh, being led by a, a priest. And then the, because of the, of the murder and the, and the shootings in, in, on the 9th of January, revolutionary changes in consciousness, and which is a, a, a very interesting thing that we should know, that consciousness is not static, it can, it can change within 24 hours. And then we're in a period where such changes will take place. And that's what happened with 1905. There was a huge change in consciousness. Uh, the workers themselves, through at Soviets for the first time, workers' councils, which obviously were, um, as Lenin said, the embryo of workers' power. That's where he drew the conclusion from. It was, it was an invention of the Bolsheviks, and although they did have a bit, they had quite a bit of a sectarian attitude towards the, the Soviets, Trotsky, on the other hand, became the president of the Petrograd uh, Soviet and showed the workers were in the forefront of, of a revolutionary struggle. But unfortunately, it didn't end in a victory. It ended in a defeat. And uh, therefore, they, the defeat itself led to um, counter-revolution and uh, uh, a reaction to coming to power. Um, there were attempts to, to fuse together the, the Mons. They were still in one party, after all, the, the Mensheviks and the, and the Bolsheviks. They were still in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. They were affiliated to the Second International. Uh, there were two wings of the party. You could say, then, these um, political differences which emerged were like the differences between revolution and reformism, if you want to be, or opportunism. That was the kind of division that was taking place. And those, those um, divisions grew wider as the conditions uh, developed. First of all, there was a unity in the revolution, and then things started to move apart. And uh, the Third Congress, for instance, of the uh, Russian Social Democratic Party, held by the Bolsheviks, again, was in London in early 1905 where they developed the character of the revolution and so on and so forth. Um, but these years were very difficult. People, it was, there was a huge reaction. Uh, uh, there was the demoralization. There was the disintegration of the, of the party. There was suicides. There was despair. There was a very, very dark period for um, uh, uh, revolution at that particular moment. And Lenin, again, took to the battlefield of preserving the ideas and uh, in 1907, 1908, there was, a, there was a, a struggle that took place in the Bolshevik party over, over philosophy, as a matter of fact, um, where a section was putting forward the idea of a kind of idealistic view of philosophy, um, of um, material criticism, as it was, uh, uh, imperial criticism, rather, as it was called. And Ren uh, Lenin went and studied in the, in the London uh, British Museum and other places, and wrote a book, uh, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, which is a brilliant uh, defense of dialectical materialism, which was the basis of the party. And they, he, he didn't uh, uh, tolerate any kind of deviation from genuine Marxism. That's the whole point. And therefore, um, you know, there are these uh, historians talk about oh, uh, Lenin, you know, was a dictator in the party and waved a big stick and all the rest of it. It was just a completely uh, wrong, completely false view of, of, of the democracy, actually. It was in the Bolshevik Party, which is extremely democratic, 
people to say what they want. It was based on democratic centralism, which again is perhaps a misused term. It is what it means is that you have a democratic debate within the ranks of the party, you have a democratic vote, and the majority vote decides and therefore should be carried out by everybody concerned. And that was the basis. It, it wasn't a, a Russian invention, by the way. It was, it, it was, that was the, the German social democracy. Anyway, it's, many, it's, it's generally the case in trade unions. We have a strike here. We have a debate and everybody should carry out whatever the, um, the dec decision is of, of, the, of the mass meeting in relation to a strike or not a strike. So it's a democracy of the movement. And, the, and that was the, the real characteristic of Bolshevism. You, you had an extreme example of that, I think, in, in 1918. Again, these people said, oh, it's a dictatorship, the Bolsheviks, and so on. In 1918, with this big difference of opinion about foreign policy, where um, the, the, the Germans were advancing against the revolution, against the, and occupied large sections of, of, of Russia, and uh, there, were, there was negotiations at Brest-Litovsk, and Lenin uh, wanted to immediately to sign this agreement because he knew that the, that the, 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 the army, the Russian army, was, was completely exhausted. And they had to, to, to try and uh, make a deal. But in the party, uh, led by Bukharin, was uh, one who demanded a revolutionary war. He said, you know, that, and that, uh, you know, uh, that the, uh, the position was to be advance, advance. Okay? And, and he had a daily newspaper, an opposition daily newspaper, advocating these views. So it's, it wasn't uh, true that this, this, is, this party was uh, a monolithic party. Otherwise. It was very democratic and open, which is very important. And, and I should cut across this bourgeois. Kind of propaganda, if you like, that's always put forward by these intellectuals to slander the uh, the real uh, heritage of the revolution and of Bolshevism. Um, of course, uh, we can't go through the whole of Bolshevism and the history. history. That's not uh, the purpose. Perhaps it's sort of wet comrades' appetites, I suppose. Um, the Bolshevik Party itself was only formally created in 1912, and when when uh, uh, it, was, it was created as a separate party. And they had quite a, a following in the Russian working class. They launched a, a Pravda as a daily paper. paper. But of course, uh, these events were, 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 were um, cut across by the World War in August 1914, which shattered the entire uh, working class movement internationally, that the international, uh, which was supposed to be a Marxist international, at the head of which was Kautsky, you know, um, Instead of uh, opposing the World War, instead of opposing the Imperialist War, they capitulated and uh, uh, all the uh, leaders of the Second International, all the workers' leaders in the main, went behind their own ruling classes and uh, supported the war, so supported the slaughter of workers uh, killing one another. And this was the, 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 the death of socialism, really. It was the, dark, the darkest period you could think of. And where the ideas of genuine socialism were reduced to a tiny handful. In 1915, there was a, a conference organized in Zimmerwald, in, in the mountains of Switzerland, and a, a Lenin uh, kind of joked, really, that they were like uh, the whole of, the, of all, the, all the internationals of the world could be put into two stagecoaches to come up with this particular conference. You know, the, the, the Bolsheviks, you had uh, Connolly in Ireland, uh, of uh, James, of, of um, John McLean, of, uh, uh, of a, a small handful, really, of, of, um, of Luxembourg, clearly, and, and, and uh, Liebknecht in Germany. And a very small number of people gathered together in this, in this, de this de depressed period of the war, looking for some kind of way out. And Lenin raised the idea that this was a betrayal, and uh, that's what uh, Rosa Luxembourg said, it was, uh, uh, it, uh, that the Second International was a stinking corpse. But Lenin drew the conclusion, yes, we need a new international, a third international. The people didn't actually go along with that idea, but it was very advanced. After all, look at the conditions around us and so on and so forth. And yet, within a space of two years, the Bolsheviks were in power. <laughs> Lenin and the Bolsheviks had taken power, which again shows how a situation can change very rapidly on the basis of events. And, uh, and that <laughs> these are the events that also today are coming. You know, on, on, in, a, in a huge way, well, they would affect if they were changing. In other words, you have what the, the, the molecular process of revolution going on in the minds of the masters. That's the point about it. It breaks out. I mean, at least, at least think about it. And that's what happened in the February Revolution of 1917, where the Bolsheviks didn't have a majority, they were in a minority. Soviets were created again, like in 1905, 
which was the dress rehearsal of the revolution of 1917. But the majority went, went to that, followed the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries. And they were compromisers. They didn't want to go the whole hog. Yes, the workers had overthrown Tsarism. Power was in the hands of the working class in the form of the Soviets. And they could have uh, easily taken power. But they, the, the, the leadership, the reformers' leadership, was a block against that. And uh, Lenin's position, and again, again, all these lies about Lenin the being favored of a coup and, and violence and all the rest of it for the sake of it. I mean, it's all out on um, uh, Cod's wallet. In 1917, he raised the idea of, of what's the basic, this what's the basis of our um, our, our program. It's, it's patiently explain the ideas. But, it, but before I get to that, there's a very interesting thing that occurred that in April 1917, Lenin came back as the other revolutions were doing from abroad because they're all in exiles, and they had an emergency conference. And Lenin, uh, on his own, raised it. They said that we have to change the perspective of the of the Russian Revolution completely. Out should go this idea of the democratic dictatorship of proletariat and peasantry, and in should be a new revolution based on a socialist perspective, which is incredible. This was a dramatic uh, change. In fact, the only person who put such a, a similar idea forward was Trotsky. Lenin didn't get any support originally until he, until the, he was at the he was at the win over the ranks of the of the party, starting with the the, the ranks of the Bolshevik party, the worker members was were more in direct contact with the revolution, that they needed a second revolution, and that should be a socialist revolution. Of course, the conditions for socialism did not exist in Russia, and this was not the idea of socialism in one country, which is put forward by Stalin in 1924 and afterwards. This is an internationalist perspective that the Bolsheviks said that the working class should come to power, supported by the poor peasantry. It would be a socialist revolution. It would be the beginning of the world socialist revolution. In other words, the capitalism would break its weakest link, and then there'd be a chain reaction internationally, and the world revolution would be successful and bring to Russia the material basis on which they could also advance to, uh, to, revolu to, to socialism itself. So it was an international perspective, uh, really on the lines of what Trotsky was arguing. It's like permanent revolution. But it was a battle to re-equip the Bar Party in, in April 1970, which he did, which is very interesting correspondence, which you can you can read about uh, letters from afar, for instance, which is, 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 which is was a, uh, a key uh, a document. To, it changed the perspective and then patiently explained the ideas. Yes, bread, land, peace, but all power to the Soviets. Uh, and, 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 and he wanted a peaceful revolution. He said, look, you, you are the Mensheviks, you're the social revolution. You have the majority. You have the majority in the Soviets. You take power and we can have a peaceful Democratic discussion in the Soviets as to which way forward, what program should should uh, succeed, but they turned that idea down, of course. And in actual fact, they moved to to oppress uh, and suppress the the Bolshevik Party in in July, in the July days, and Lenin had to go into hiding at that time. But this this uh, very uh, attack on the left encouraged the right wing and above all the military in Russia to launch a coup against. Uh, 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 Kerensky and the provisional government and to eradicate the, the revolution. And that was in the form of the, of the coup of General um, Kornilov in, uh, in, in August 1917. And the Bolsheviks, not being sectarian, mobilized um, their supporters to, to fight the counter-revolution. And in so doing, also criticizing the, the provisional government and so on. And on the basis of that, on this, you know, there was the action and Marxism is not just ideas, it's a guide to action. And they were able, on the basis of a, a united front policy, patiently explaining, being in the forefront, in the trenches, in, in, in the workplaces, arguing for these ideas, they won a majority in the Soviets. And the reason why the October Revolution was, uh, wasn't a mass revolution like in, in February 1970, it wasn't needed. It was a bit, because no one supported it, or the support for the provisional government was hardly there. And even the bourgeois historians talk about that as well. Well, you know, there was no one there to support it. You didn't need it. It was, it was brushed aside. The regime was brushed aside and the Soviets took power peacefully. That was the whole point. It was a peaceful revolution. And incidentally, they set up a coalition government. It, wasn't a, it, was, a, it was a government of Bolsheviks and left social revolutionaries that led the revolution. And it was the beginning of the world revolution. And that, 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 this period opened up, 1917, 1923, of revolution after revolution after revolution. 
and above all, uh, the German Revolution, you know, that was the key thing. In, in uh, November 1918, power was in the hands of the working class. At least that was. They weren't, they weren't led by Bolsheviks, they were led by social democrats, right-wing social democrats, who gave power back to the ruling class. And therefore, rather than having a social revolution in Germany, which would have changed the entire fate of, of the world, changed it, there wouldn't have been any fascism, there would have been a, a socialist world long ago, they betrayed the revolution, which shows the importance of leadership. You know, you could have good leaders, bad leaders, you could have treacherous leaders, you could have lead, well, what we are, what the Bolsheviks were, and Lenin didn't, you know, it's interesting in fact, without Lenin, there wouldn't have been a Russian revolution. Because he, he personified the experience of the past. He generalized the experience of Marxism. I was able at a crucial time to change the perspective of the Bolshevik party. Of course, there's, there's a, and, and this explains also the, uh, the Marxist view of, of the importance of, of individuals in history. We don't deny the importance of individuals in history, but it has to be linked to social conditions, the class, the party, the leadership. Without the Bolshevik party, Lenin would be nothing, you know, be a, a voice in the wilderness. But the Bolshevik party without Lenin also, because you see the, the tendencies to compromise and, and not really clear the way forward, which Lenin did and was able to, to turn the tide. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the, the individual in history played a key role, you know, the subjective factor plays a key role. That's the importance of a theoretically equipped um, organization and tendency Otherwise, if you don't learn from the past, if you don't learn from this rich heritage that is there, then you will make mistakes. And the whole idea, of course, we can all make mistakes. The thing is to make the, not, not make too many, but also to learn from the mistakes, because obviously every new situation, every situation can be new, but there's also old elements in the, in the situation itself. So we have the Bolsheviks come into power, the Third International is created, but of course, the whole perspective is based upon this uh, or international revolution and, and the bourgeoisie international weren't prepared to, to allow that so they sent in 21 foreign armies to crush the worker state you know the british the germans the french the japanese they all moved in to crush the bolshevik revolution they instigated a civil war of, of the rights of the counter-revolution of all these generals of rankel of denikin who layer of them which were, were organized and financed and armed by imperialism, world imperialism, in order to crush the Bolshevik revolution, in order to crush the, the young workers state. And they were fighting for their lives. And given the fact that the world war, we had a civil war from 1918, 1920, which nearly lost the revolution as a matter of fact, it was amazing that Trotsky was able to organize a red army from nothing to 5 million. And they were, it wasn't the, it wasn't the firepower, it was the propaganda of the Bolsheviks in affecting the troops, the British troops, they had leaflets uh, uh, sent down to them in English. To, Why are you fighting against us? We're only fighting for working class people. You should be doing the same. It was internationalism in action, which defeated the counter-revolution itself. But at what cost? A colossal cost. I mean, in, in uh, of, of terrible famine, we taught him, and, and uh, all, all the destruction of the civil war and the war and so on. Petrograd, for, for instance, was a population of two and a half million, was reduced to half a million. People were starving. People were fainting in work and so on and so on. There terrible conditions in which a growing bureaucracy elbowed the working class aside more and more and more. And this isolation of the, in a backward country resulted in a bureaucratization, unfortunately, of the state and of, of, uh, of the party, which became um, and that were personified uh, in, in, in the form of Stalin, who began to rep represent these, these layers. And Lenin's last struggle, by the way, was a, a block with uh, uh, Trotsky to fight Stalin and fight uh, the, um, the bureaucratization within the state itself. In fact, his, his last testament asked to, demanded the removal of Stalin and talked about, about Trotsky as the most uh, able man on the Central Committee and so on. But uh, Objective conditions were, to, were moving against the revolution. There was an ebb in the world revolution. There were defeats. We had revolution after revolution. We were defeated and defeated and defeated. And that isolated the Bolshevik revolution. And we said to the, 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 the this um, besieged fortress then degenerating politically, unfortunately, at the rise of, of Stalinism. But, you know, you know the, the, the measures that had to be taken, we called it the Red Terror and so on. Well, the Red, the red Terror was, was, a, was a response to the White Terror. 
particularly in Finland, where 20,000 workers were murdered, and then all these bourgeois historians say, oh, look at these, look at how terrible it was, and so on. They, and they did ban the opposition parties, so they were supporting counter-revolution. I mean, in Britain, we, we banned the, 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 uh, the Union of, of British Fascists, and Mosley was imprisoned during the war, uh, for obvious reasons. And likewise, in Russia, those parties which supported the rights and, and the counter-revolution were also banned as well. The, of course, this was they hoped they were released, you know, and, 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 and so on, as conditions uh, emerged. If there was a victory elsewhere, they could release things and, and things would, would get back, back on even track. But, you know, the, the isolation of the revolution put, put a stop uh, to that. And uh, nevertheless, we, we have to understand it was a great, the greatest breakthrough of the world that showed in action what could be done uh, by the working class. And uh, therefore, I mean, in, in looking at uh, Lenin's uh, years, and the, the fact it's 150 years since his birth. The main thing is to learn the theory, I would say. Here are 45 volumes of Lenin's collected works. There are key writings, you know, of imperialism, of what is to be done, of state and revolution, of uh, uh, left-wing communism and infantile disorder, of the, of the, there's many, many, and, and I hope this, this uh, talk, if you want, gives you a bit of a thirst to go into these ideas. We ourselves have produced uh, literature, books, uh, Bolshevism by Alan Woods, which is a classic, I think, in the history of uh, dealing with this period, of, uh, of Ted Grant's book of uh, Russia from revolution to counter-revolution, and also the co-authored book on um, uh, Lenin and Trotsky, what they really stood for. These are things to arm us with the real ideas of Leninism, which in practice is, is the ideas of Marxism brought up to date. And therefore, we, we, if we're going to equip ourselves for this period, after all, I mean, just so the, the, today's news, they're talking about a famine of biblical proportions. A famine is going to involve 265 million people. You know, the, the, the deepest crisis of capitalism, there's going to be wave after wave of revolution taking place. The $64,000 question is, is this uh, revolutionary wave going to be successful or not? And that depends on the building of genuine Marxist uh, forces internationally. There's no other way about it to prepare the ground for a revolution. We, do, we don't create the revolution ourselves. We prepare for the revolution so that it can succeed. And that's the, the real essence of Marxism, the generalized historical experience of the working class. So I therefore, I, well, I'd like to, to end uh, really with a quote um, by Rosa Luxemburg, I think who sums it all up. Uh, whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness, and consistency in an historic hour, Lenin, Trotsky, and the other comrades have given in good measure. All the revolutionary honor and capacity which Western social democracy lacked was represented by the Bolsheviks. The October uprising was not only the actual salvation of the Russian revolution, it was also the salvation of the honor of international socialism. And I think that Luxembourg quote really sums up the essence of, uh, of Bolshevism and the task that they, they did it. And the reason for that, they were prepared to go to the end armed, not with uh, ideas which are for the, for the study, but ideas which are for the class struggle. And that's the theory of Marxism. And it's down to the forces of the international Marxist tendency to build these forces internationally and prepare the ground. And therefore, I ask you, those who are not members of the IMT, to join us in this period of world revolution, the, uh, a time of Lenin and Leninism, and for the, the victory that would be possible. Because in one country, if you have a victory that now, you'll act like a chain reaction throughout the world. And therefore, it's in, within our grasp. I therefore urge you to, yes, study these ideas. But now let us apply them to this new epoch of world revolution that is opening up today. Thank you very much.